All right, Bitmang, today is Tuesday. It is December 21st. Welcome to the Dog Walk, presented by Barstool Sports, here with Chief. Last Tuesday, Dog Walk of the Year. Yeah, let's go out with a bang. Let's go out with a bang. Yeah. What are we banging? We're we're banging this guy named Yuri. Yuri. Yuri Bezmanov, and he was a uh, KGB, um, you know what the KGB is? Yep. Yeah, so it's like the, the Soviet Union, CIA, and he was over here and he defected, and in 1985, he gives this like 15, 20 minute interview, <clears throat> excuse me, about what the KGB is actually doing and how they operate and what their goals are uh, with their like, we'll call it warfare against the United States. And he lays it out in such a way that you're like, and you just pause and think, because again, this is in 1985 and some of the timelines that he's talking about. And then you open your eyes and you look at the world today. You're like, holy shit. I wonder if this is actually taking place. So we'll just get into get into Yuri. Yuri, yeah. yeah. Before we get into it, though, Chief, I do want to talk about uh, if Yuri, you know, ever made his way to the States mm -hmm. and whatnot. And he needed to save some money. You know, he got himself some debt. It would have been a good idea to call Upstart. Of course, of course. Like, uh, Upstart, this is America. You know, you want to have, you, you get, this is a capitalist society. People want to buy things. And sometimes you get a little bit out of your depths and you get into a little bit of debt. And Upstart's here to help you manage that, get back on the right track. Thank God for Upstart. And this is, you know, holiday time of year. This is a lot of times. A lot of people get in themselves a little bit of credit card debt. So make sure you're, if that's you, make sure you're calling uh, Upstart to get your, everything settled under control with your finances. Absolutely, because Upstart is the fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan that's all done online. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. Rather than looking at your credit score alone, Upstart considers other factors like your income, current employment, and credit history to find you a smarter rate for your loan. You can check your rate without impacting your credit score in minutes for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. You can even receive the funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. So find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash Eddie. That's upstart.com slash Eddie, E-D-D-I-E. -E. Don't forget to use that URL because it lets them know that you uh, came from this show. That helps us out a lot. Once again, loan amounts will be determined based on your credit income and certain other information provided in your loan application. Upstart.com slash Eddie. Start saving. Uh, you know, let's just start being smarter about saving today. Okay? Great New Year's resolution. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Use Upstart.com mm -hmm. slash Eddie. All right. Yuri. 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 So, again, this is back in 1985. So, this is, you know, the Cold War is still raging pretty much, right? The, the Soviet Union hasn't fallen yet. Maybe it's, maybe it's starting actually in 80 by 85 to like kind of temper down. But then there's also the story in 83 where we almost went to nuclear war because they were like so afraid of Reagan. They felt like things slipping away from them. And so Yuri gets out. He's he's in the United States 1985. He's doing like a, a 60 minutes type of interview. And he's like, you know, everybody thinks we're like it's James Bond versus the Russian equivalent. And it's this, you know, high powered spies, espionage, this and that you're breaking into files, stealing top secret things. He's like, he's like, that accounts for like 15% of our budget. He goes, the other 85% of time, money, manpower, um, were dedicated to what he called, uh, psychological warfare and ideological subversion. So he said that was the stated goal of the KGB. So it wasn't to like get the micro trip or nuclear secrets or anything like that. It was really to kind of like make the United States kind of eat itself from the inside and just attack the way like uh, our people think and our way of life and all these different things and just try to get it to like crumble onto itself. And he said that this the the goal, like his quote about it was, to change the perception of reality to such an extent that despite an abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensical conclusions on how to defend themselves, their family, or their country. And he said that this was like a, uh, it's like a form of like brainwashing in a way that they wanted to really like infiltrate our society and take us down that way because they couldn't, because of, you know, they call it mutually assured destruction which was both countries have these nuclear weapons, right? So if you talk, if you learn about like the Cuban Missile Crisis, well, they have like these nukes pointed at each other 
And if we decide to go to war militarily with Russia, any time, well, really even now too, but any time from 50 whatever until the collapse of Soviet Union, what that would mean was all out nuclear war, the destruction of the planet. So nobody really wanted that, but you also wanted to win the war. And Russia economically is not at our level. So they were always trying to like come up with different ways to beat us. And this was how they decided to put 85% of their budget because you don't want to get into a fight militarily. You can't really, the United States really ended the Cold War by using the dollar as a weapon. Like they just like outspend them. Like they're just, hey, like we're developing the microchip. We're going outer space. We got all these different programs. We're rebuilding our military. And Russia just couldn't keep up. And their economy kind of collapsed essentially because of that. And um, so they were using this other thing that was like he said, it was a very slow process and it was broken into four uh, different phases or categories. So he said the first was called the moralization. And that takes uh, multiple generations, but the first phase of it takes 15 to 20 years. And they said, why does it take that long? He says that uh, is how long it takes to generate or uh, to educate one generation of students. So if you have, and he said that this really started in like the 60s. So you have all like the kind of the hippie revolution, this and that, and they're getting into, you know, all four. So if they're educated in the 60s and the 70s, then they're like, the yuppies kind of in the eighties where they're young and they're trying to climb and grow in their different industries. And they're like, we really focused on, uh, positions in the government positions in the military, um, education and media. And then like Hollywood, like those were like the, the, the sectors that they really targeted. Um, and then they said civil servants as well. And so then you, you kind of indoctrinate this era of people. So you get these people into, the system. So they're the, by then after like 15 to 20 years, those people that you like kind of manipulated into your way of thinking through this cultural subversion. Now, as time goes on, they're in power. So now they're able to change policy. They're able to change curriculum. They're able to change all these different things um, like little by little. And it's like once they're in, then they're in. Like they're just like the, once those policies are in, those people are in power are in. He's like, there's, he's like, this is like an irreversible thing that you just can't root these people out of power because like they've been ascending th to this path for like 20 years. So it's like, you didn't like when it was going on th this plan again, this interview was in 1985. So this was like almost 40 years ago now. And you are like, holy shit, this is what they started. They started planning it in the sixties, started to kind of take hold in the eighties and nineties. And maybe now would be it kind of relates back to that Strauss Howe theory a little bit where it's like these things kind of go in cycles and maybe they were catching this wave where like we can kind of change the way America thinks um, and, and push these agendas forward through like, like so their KGB agents would like infiltrate education systems and this and all these different things. So you have like this indoctrination of people and then that, that once that group of people and that generation of student gets into power, like no one has, no one has really noticed, but then it's also too late. So you can't really dig yourself out or root these people out. Cause it's just like, this is what these people believe. And now they're in the power and they're the ones who are going to push it forward even further. So that's phase one. He said, uh, phase two is largely predicated on, uh, destabilization. And that has to do with the economy foreign relations and defense. Like those are the three sectors that they targeted for that. And it's like, so if it's the economy, is it crazy inflation? Is it the housing market crash? Is like how much is, how much are they able to attack and destabilize the economy? So people are like, are hurting and they get even angrier and they get, you know, because it's like, well, I used to be able to afford a thing of gas. Now I can't, now I can't go to work. I can't do this. I can't do that. Uh, chaos abroad. Uh, there's been 20 years of, you know, blunders, I would say, the United States abroad um, and then defense. So like our, if we if we fall behind militarily. So that's another one. He said that phase takes like anywhere. And he's like the crisis will go in cycles. But he goes that, that takes like two to five years to really put a country into crisis. Um, and then once you're in or to destabilize a country and then then you have like a crisis event. That's phase three. Like you want to get people like like panicked in a crisis where they're, uh, they don't know what to do. He says that could take only six weeks. And then he said that the fourth phase 
they call it normalization. So it's like you just get these people to when they're in crisis mode just to just accept it. Like this is just the way things are. We're just going to accept this crisis mode. And that would go to uh, uh, the things that they want to have like last. And definitely this guy said uh, a, a poor and unstable economy, uh, a demonization of free market competition, a limit of, of free speech, uh, train people to think that they're in peacetime because he would say that like, we're doing this and we're at war. Like, the, you know, it's not guns blazing, but like we think you know, we're doing this as like basically an act of war is what this KGB guy was saying. And then you attack like cultural historical ideals. And then you want to have like a government that can like limit people's freedoms. And then he's like, you know what? And he's like, then there's just nowhere left to defect to. He's like, you know, back in the day, if you were Eastern Europe, you can flee to the West. If you were a Russian, you could or Chinese, you can always, you can escape, and or if you're North Korean, you can go to South Korea. Like you can get away from these kind of totalitarian uh, ideals, these Marxist Leninist things. He goes, if it takes root here, then there's nowhere left to affect, and we've won. And that's what this guy is saying. Like they have this grand plan, a multi generational plan that they put in in place, and really started using the '60s and ramped it up through the '70s and the '80s. And then it's like, who knows what happened to that because the uh, USSR fell. But maybe if you look around, you might be able to see indications that some of these things have have taken root. And it's it's a little bit. Yeah, know. I was going to say that still happens, right? Yeah, I would say like it, it, and it's like, you know, and it's like hard to point to like, oh, that was Russia. or They infiltrated this or did that. Like nobody really knows. But it's it does seem like there's like people are just angry all the time and things are more polarized than ever. And, you know, it's not the, uh, the, you know, the way speech was or comedy was or all these different things. Like you talk about cancel culture and all these different things that seem to have like taken root in our society that maybe those like seedlings were planted way back, you know, 60 years ago, you know, that could very well be based upon what this guy was saying in the eighties and, uh, you know, and he's like a classic kind of Russian looking character just giving this interview. And then there's this other guy uh, who is a psychologist called Carl Jung. Have you ever heard of him? Sounds familiar. He's a guy who like you've heard of Freud. Yeah. So this is a guy who is like next in line after Freud. So okay. he like studied under Freud and he there he would reference this. uh uh, he would call it mass psychosis of a culture and not, not, he's not related to this other guy at all, but he said that that's the, there's this old Latin thing that he would reference. And he said, uh, man is a wolf to man, basically being like the only, th and he goes on to explain, he goes, it is not famine, not earthquakes, not microbes, not cancer, but man himself, who is man's greatest danger to man for the simple reason that there is no adequate protection against psychic endemics or epidemics rather, which are infinitely more devastating uh, than the worst of the natural catastrophes. And, it, and, and then he would reference that like, this is not like some theory that this is something that often historically has taken place um, in different cultures in America. And he would reference like the witch, witch hunts that happened in the 1500s and the 1600s from like, you know, Western Europe and, and obviously the Salem witch trials where they would kill thousands of women like thousands of women got killed over that period of time because everyone's like you're a fucking witch and they think that the reason like that these mass psychosis things happen is that society and culture when things are destabilized and fucked up will get transfixed on one idea and they'll look for a scapegoat for all their problems and in the 15th and 16th centuries that was women who were witches and they, you know, they, you know, we've covered, I think we've done an episode on the Salem witch trials before. No, Maybe. we did uh like Halloween, like how witches came to be. So okay. kind of, in, okay. In, yeah. In a roundabout, a roundabout way. way. But so that was just like, clearly those women were not witches clearly, but the whole of society treated them as if they were witches because like that idea took root and there doesn't matter how much like to the other guy Yuri said doesn't matter how much evidence there is to the contrary that they're not witches she's a fucking witch uh, if she's not a witch throw her off the cliff and if she flies away then she's a witch if she doesn't well she died an honorable death and like that's how they would like test to see if you're a witch and then same thing that they would say you know Carl Jung would say about um, what happened in the 20th century where 
if it was either the USSR, you know, the Bolsheviks, the murdering millions and millions and millions of people, the Chinese Revolution uh, that killed 50 million people, Hitler killed, you know, 6 million Jews. It's all about finding a political or racial uh, dissident that you can like put all of your problems of like how you perceive problems in society, like look for a scapegoat and it can be women, Jews, whoever. And it's, he called that like a mass psychosis. And that's the thing that really crumbles and caves society. And it's like, you know, end of days and Rome had some of that, some elements of that too. And it's just, you know, you have to be very careful about and like pay attention to things that are going on because it does feel like the only thing that can stop human progress is other humans. So we should all just, everyone just chill out and, and like pay attention to these things and really think about like what's going on um, because it's could be, could be fake, could be real. I don't know. It could be like whatever our, our, I don't know what our modern equivalent of the witch would be, but like, let's make sure we're not throwing witches off of cliffs because that's something that has happened many times in history. And then maybe it, sometimes it happens by accident. Like, I don't think there's some kind of cultural subversion going on with the witch trials and stuff, but you know, if this was something that was intentionally done by the by the KGB and Russia and, and other people, and who knows, maybe still being done, we still have people who don't like us, um, that we have to pay attention, make sure we are like thinking through the things that we're doing and saying and believing because it's just like we could have people just trying to fuck up our whole culture, according to this guy. Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> I mean, rambled the, through a lot there. No, yeah, yeah, but isn't it like we did the, like the Chinese bot one? The what one? Remember the, the Chinese bots on Twitter? Yeah, like that could yeah, be yeah, you know, yeah. in Russian bots too. Yeah, like yeah, the yeah. Russians had that uh they have like a whole institute where they would they they probably if you're if you're the KGB or you you came out of this school, which Putin was in the cage, he was a KGB agent. I don't know if we've talked about that before, but he was like a legitimate KGB agent. Then the Russian, you know, the Soviet Union collapse. He was a taxi driver for a bit. I don't know. Did you know that? He said no. that. He said that like last week. He's like in the 90s when things were like, where, who was the documentary we did about that hockey team in the 90s? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Penguins. The Penguins with Dante. And it was like the whole society was just like in utter chaos. Well, at that time, Putin was like, he had some government job, but then he was driving a cab on the side to like make extra money because it was just like, there was no money. Like there was no like stable currency. It was like Russia was like the wild, wild west. So he was doing that. But he is like brought up in the KGB. So that thing where they have the um they call it something something institute. But it was just basically they have like these Twitter bot farms. And that was like a big thing in like sixteen and like leading up to sixteen and after, where you would have this person like, Oh, I'm gonna start this like uh mm -hmm. thing about Chevy trucks. And we're going to just have a page on Facebook or Instagram that's all about Chevy trucks. Nothing but trucks for two years. You build up this account to have 60, 70,000, 80,000 followers, some big number. And then on a dime, you start dropping in things about like Black Lives Matter or CRT or these just these other like things that are not related to Chevy trucks at all. But all those people who were like following that account are now getting that on their feet, even though they never really wanted to but like, but then it just pisses people off. So as that was like a tactical thing that they were doing, Russia was doing and China too, to create this, like foment this dissent and like get people in America angry at each other and make it seem like the problems are like bigger than they are. And uh, so that that's like, it's, it's like right out of this guy's playbook. Facebook has, I believe, taken steps to fix that. Supposedly they both have, yeah. And uh, it was like 2017. I did a podcast with Social Danny. And um, he had a blog that he did. He had mm -hmm. like a, you know, whatever. And it was like yeah. Danny's blog or whatever. Yeah. And we were like, all right, let's switch it over to what the name of the podcast was. And they wouldn't let him switch it. Really? I was like, this could mislead your audience. Like, huh. They wouldn't even let him switch the name. Wow. Yeah. So it was pretty interesting that you that bring that up. And, yeah. and that's like, and it's, I mean, he was still, you know. Yeah. It would be like if we change this. It would be the same content, just a different name Yeah, for exactly. You guys. If yeah. we change this show to like, you know, that show. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. And they would say, no, like you can't do that. Interesting. I didn't know that. That's misleading towards your audience. Yeah. So, it was so they, they, yeah, they, and both, all the social media platforms have said that they're like taking steps because, but like, they didn't know about it 
and this was going on for years because it's like how do you like that like everyone's super critical of big tech and i obviously have been too but it's like how can you possibly monitor and enforce rules on something that big you know we're talking yeah, about millions and millions and millions of users and millions and millions and millions of pieces of content like how can you success that's why I was, like if i were twitter or facebook i'd just be like oh, we're not doing any of that shit it's a wild west like yeah but like don't you think you should have to use your identity to open an account i don't know i don't know <sighs> Like, it's like what? What's my? I'm Barcel Chief. It's not on my birth certificate. But it's like, but if you registered and it's like you, you know, you gave some credible information. But yeah. Like, hey, I'm, I'm Ryan Brandell, but I'm gonna go by Barcel Chief. Yeah. You no. Know? I, yeah. And it's like even if I want to open up fucking, um, whatever, yeah. Faux Polini, you know, yeah. I'm gonna open up a a, a a a just random meme account, but yeah. it's just operated under me. There should be some accountability at this point, in my eyes. I don't know. I, I agree, but then I'm also like, what's where's the balance between responsibility and privacy? Because I feel like you still still should be able to have a level of privacy on the internet where you can say things and not necessarily, you know. Yeah, and I, and I get that, like, you should be able to, you know, keep some type of anonymity. Anonymity, that's a hard word. That's to say. such a hard word. Um, but, like, that platform's too big now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if you want an Anon, like, platform, like, go find one. But, like, there should be a point where it just gets too much because, like, yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, Twitter is ruining, like, the world. Yeah. <laughs> you and know? We'll see how it goes now, like, with this new guy in charge, too. But it's, like, we've talked about this. I remember having this discussion on Sirius back in the day. But it's, like, it's almost like I look at Twitter and Facebook as almost like the public square. Not that I use Facebook anymore, but, you know, you're like... You can't like just the same way you couldn't just kick out somebody's soapbox back in the day when you're like giving a speech to the public or like printing out leaflets or whatever it was. I don't know that you should be able to be limited for things that you say, like no matter what, like even if it's it's one of those things where it's like people are anti cancer culture, but it's also like and, and I do think it's gone too far, but that's always kind of been there on some level where it's like, I don't fucking like this guy for things he says, so I'm not supporting him anymore. But he still should be able to say those things that I don't like. Yeah, but if you're saying shit, I, it, but it's like, it's a, it's a burn box, though. And a lot of, if these, if these are not real people and they're not putting their, like, yeah. at some point, it's just not, you know, you're, you're, it's propaganda, right? I mean, you're just put, you're, you're pushing a narrative. Like, but then who is to decide what's propaganda? I know. That's the part where it gets hard. It, well, I mean, if, if propaganda, if they have all these accounts registered, it's like, oh, wow, we got 500, you know, yeah. tweet, Twitter saying this, and it's all operated by yeah. one guy. Like, yeah, that's a, probably a fucking problem. Yeah, no, that definitely, definitely is. I guess I wonder, like, <clears throat> you know, we live on Twitter, right? Our company, and, like, I'm on Twitter all the time, all day. If I have my phone in my hand, odds are I'm on Twitter. And like the negative ones always stick out more, but then you look at it and it's like that, that's a two follower thing. Like, and I just dismiss it if I get like a super negative yeah. comment. Mm -hmm. So then I just, a lot of people don't though. Yeah, I guess. I, a lot of people don't. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I've seen White Sox Dave like argue all night <laughs> long with, you know, accounts that are like, that's a fake account. Like yeah. what are you arguing with that? You know? You know? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I do not know what the answer is. I just, I gear to, uh, I trend to lean towards, uh, like more free speech and just like let the chips fall where yeah. they may. Like, cause I just don't trust, like, I don't know who you would put in charge of deciding like what's good and fit to be on I the I mean, the, the real people on that account, on that platform are bad enough. Like the blue checks and all these fucking weirdos are yeah. bad enough that like yeah. the, the cesspool of those people just, you know, just bring it down with the blue checks, you know? When did the internet, because so, the internet used to be way more fun. Yeah. When did that well, flip? Do you I have, don't know. I think maybe, I think tomorrow we might be doing a free swim with Dante. Yeah. I, uh, we should ask him. I think he's kind of getting into like the nft metaverse thing i don't know if that, i don't if, understand that either do at I. all if you want to do like your anon thing and you want like a fake world like push them all into that i don't know <laughs> but isn't meta isn't the metaverse just facebook like that's all it is right is it's not its own platform i think it's like I, the way i view it is it's like if you've seen ready player one 
No, I don't think so. That's like the interpretation I have. Like, it's just okay. like, you know, like your NFT, it could be like, um, like a, like a big shot in this world, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> But I, I don't know for sure. But I like I know like Marty tweets about it. Like I just bought another one, and I, and I still don't see. I don't understand the value. I don't understand it. I think that's it though, because I think it's it it gets to a world where it's say if you had, um, you know, NFT, uh, uh, G Joe, you know the guy's name, and yeah. it's like yo, like you're at a table, you're at like a club or something. It's like yo, and that guy's like a big shot in that world, like yeah. Who knows? Like he owns like casinos or something. I guess. And you're like, hey, dude, that guy's whatever in the metaverse. It's like, oh fuck, that guy's like a big deal. And then that like, inter- that's that's the interpretation I have. So we ha- far. I know a guy. His name is JJ Lane, and if that name sounds familiar, it's because he used to be on The Bachelor or Bachelorette or one of those. Mm-hmm. And he was like a finance guy in New York, moved to Colorado, and then like three years ago started getting NFTs. He's made like a fucking killing. So maybe we should just have him on and be like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. What are you doing? What is this NFT shit? Yeah. Because I, I still like people have explained it to me so many times. And I'm, and it's like, no, you own that picture. But I'm like, I'm looking at it on my phone. What do you mean you own yeah, it? Yeah, I don't like I, I get that. And I believe like uh, Top Shot has like not been at the level that they came in. Because, you know, yeah. Top Shot is yeah, yeah. the NBA ones yep. who was like. Buy this Steph Curry three, you know. Right. I don't understand that yeah. completely, but this like fake world thing is, that's, it makes sense. Like if you're a big shot and you're a fucking so it, a swinging dick in this world, and then like oh dude, you see that like so it's almost like, like when the TikTok people are could become real life kind of like is that what you're saying? Like he like let's just put it in terms I can ex- kind of understand. Like it's fu- everything is Farmville. And then you see the Kinda, guy, the guy yeah. who's got like the biggest farm at yes. the, at the at Declan's or Tao. Yes, and you're like, oh, the fuck, that's well, yeah. that's the way I'm understanding. This is like real money and shit. But I don't know. We gotta, I don't know. You got to get someone to figure this out for yeah. us because <laughs> we ain't gonna do it. I just fucking, I mean, I'm so far behind in that shit. I just like after that um, one with Marty Bent, I started doing a little Bitcoin. Yeah, and that's like, all right, I'm. I feel like I'm doing. And then there, this. I understand. So you you can Bit- never be ahead. You can never Bitcoin win. makes way more sense to me than NFTs. Than NFTs and yeah. I know they use like a similar technology, blockchain, whatever. But like a Bitcoin as a hedge against like these fiat currencies that are out of control with inflation and this and that. Like I can like wrap my brain around that from like an economic standpoint. I can't do it with NFTs. Mm -hmm. I just don't fucking get it. Well, we'll see. We'll try to get someone who could explain it to us. Um, And we'll see. Maybe Dante could help out tomorrow. I I believe Dante's coming out. We're going to do the Juice World doc. Yep, yep. Yeah, that came out. It's a music box. It's on HBO Max if you want to check it out before tomorrow. That's been – I watched the – it's been a pretty good series. So what was the first – we did Woodstock. We did Woodstock. I watched the Alanis Morissette one. I thought that was very good. So that series, Music Box, you guys want to check that out. It's worth it. Yeah, do a good job. The only one that sucked was I watched like 20 minutes of the Kenny G one. Was that good? He's like the most boring man who ever lived. (laughs) It was unbelievable. It's like he never had like any rock star moments. He was just like, I'm just this boring saxophone guy. So <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Um, but all right, Chief, thank you. Uh, that's it for today. And uh, you're probably pulling your hair out about NFTs. We'll figure it out sometime. We'll have, We're going to get to the bottom of it. If Dante can figure it out, then we will make it a priority to have someone on in January. We'll to, get JJ uh, Lane on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To uh, kind of explain it to us. Uh, thanks for listening this year. It's been a, it's been a fun uh, Tuesday year. So. This is my favorite show. So I, this is my favorite go. part of this job. So I appreciate everybody listening, following along, all that, because I, I love doing it. Yep. Thank you, Chief, for always doing it, too. Um, that's it, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll be back tomorrow with uh, the final episode of the year. See you then.